<laughs> so we were thrilled, exhausted. So my apologies. I remember reaching out to Irene in the commission. Said, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to the meeting today. So <laughs> thank you for your understanding. But it's wonderful to be with all of you today. So as we continue to admit our colleagues today, um, one of the pieces for today's meeting is going to be a specifically is going to be a working session for us and we will come back to that in a few minutes but um, at this time we're going to go ahead and do the uh, roll call so that we ensure that we are all here so that we can go ahead and move forward with the agenda and then uh, turn it over to the commissioner after the roll call for the acceptance of the minutes of the previous uh, meeting so at this time maddie would you mind doing a roll call for us thank you ingrid and just so everybody knows um our person who usually facilitates the youtube st 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 streaming my goodness is out today and we had some trouble getting access to the youtube so we are recording this meeting and it will be posted afterwards but if you see that little bar at the top that's being recorded that's why so i will start the roll call with michelle levy I'm here. Thank you. Doug Casey. Here. Uh, Roseanne O'Brien Vojak. Hi, everybody. I'm here. Catherine Gabrielson. I thought I saw her here. Oh, there she is. Um, Dr. Charles Dumay. Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Evelyn Robles Rivas. Hi, everybody. Kate Diaz. Good afternoon. Dr. Karen Dubois Walton. Dr. Karen Dubois Walton. Tim Larson. Tim Larson. Lon Seidman. Ed Klonowski. Fran Rabinowitz. Lauren Mancini Averett. And then I'm sure she's setting her mic up, but the last one is Amy Wiltsey. I'm here. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maddie. Commissioner? All right. Thank you, and great to see everyone as always. I so want to make, make sure that everyone got a copy of the minutes and you can take a peek at that if you've not done so already. Just wanted to make sure that there are no objections uh, to approving our minutes uh, from our last meeting. Any questions or comments or any changes that anyone would like to see to the minutes? All right, then see in Nothing. Kate, are you doing a quick a quick look at the minutes? <laughs> we try to make sure minutes minutes are pithy. They, <laughs> they just have exactly what we need on there. Uh, so if no changes required, uh, then we will move forward with uh, having accepting our minutes, taking that as acceptance for our minutes. Uh, of our last meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. So uh, for the purpose of today's agenda, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to turn this into a session, a working session. We have been together since September. That was their first meeting. So we have been together for a while and uh, we're going to go back and review a little bit of the what the purpose of the commission is and some of the things that we have to do. And one of the items that we have to do as a commission is actually produce a report. We need to produce a report that is due um, actually in uh, July 1st of this current year, 2022. So with that in mind, in uh, one of the aspects of the report was specifically about the commission taking a look at the landscape, not only locally, but also nationally, or what those uh, districts, the schools, states that are actually already providing some level of remote learning. So because we're going to be moving to the aspect of the developing the report that is the tangible product that we have to produce as a commission, uh, we have designed the day to day to be specifically about the components as for the legislation of the report. 
So we want you to keep in mind what the last seven meetings, number six, this one actually, all the meetings that we have had so far, everything that you have been introduced, everything that you have been presented to, and we are going to go ahead and begin to really tease apart together. We will stay as a full group. What are some of those components that you feel from your perspective need to be part of the outline of this particular report? So thank you, Irene, for um, so before you is actually the items that the report outlined to say how this report needs to be presented to the uh, to the General Assembly. So let me pause here and see if you have any questions for the commissioner or the members of the team at this point. Ingrid, while you're doing that and while folks are processing and thinking about this, uh, just to write, I, really, I, I hope you feel like we've done a lot of really great work already together. Um, and, you know, with the standards, again, you're the commission, and although the department didn't get that requirement in statute, we don't need the statute to tell us how to do this work. We have uh, the, have you here, and, and thank you, I should say, for all the, your great work in putting, uh, getting the standards uh, finalized and getting them out there and, and folks are beginning to, I know the team here has done webinars and answering questions and we have something that I know folks in other states are looking to uh, at this point in time. So thank you for that work and it's not like done and set apart and we'll never ever go back to it. That's certainly not the case, but I think we, we just went out and really had great work to be done. So everything is built together now for this kind of new focus uh, that report that Ingrid talked about that you're key to uh, and and so we have another member of our team uh, Paul uh, can wave at us and Paul uh, has joined us here has been doing some of this work in the, in the background with Irene and is actually here today because he's going to kind of run point and some of what needs to be done for this report uh, as we meet with you. So just so you know that, but I just really wanted to pause and thank you for, we've done a lot, we've heard a lot. And so it's now join up on all of that that we're gonna use in uh, looking at the outline for the report and getting your feedback to that as well. Thanks. I think Kate may have her hand, yeah. Yeah, I have a, just a quick question. Um, will we get, and Irina, you may already have this on the website, so I apologize if it is. Um, is it possible for us to get just a quick copy of the report outline, the five um, elements you currently have identified? Um, I'm one of those concrete um, learners. <laughs> of course. Um, so it is within the statute, but um, we can share the slides as well as a separate document. So we'll we're going to be creating more today, so I will share. OK, thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a great question that you asked, Kate, about even the outline. So as we put that up, this is what I think the team has called from the statute, you know, from the requirement as to what needs to be in it. And so part of today is to get further information from you so we can kind of finalize the outline. You know, what are those key elements that we need to make sure is in there based on what you've already learned or heard or just questions that you still have. So there's nothing that locks us that we can't add to this, but just know this, we had to have something to a structure. And these are kinds of the things that we pulled out of, of the, the legislation. Yeah, the outline's helpful. Yeah. I'm just gonna take, I mean, it's totally cheat and just take a picture of it. So sure. I have I really use some technology. Quiet, I'll ask again. <laughs> also, as a point of reference, if you visit the uh, the website, the statue is there. The pages that you want to make reference are pages from 604 to 607 because the full statue is being provided. So if you focus on 604 to 607, that will give you the summary of the, the role and specifically about the details of the of the report itself. So any other questions at this point? Seeing none. Um, one of the things that I would like to do, and I know Irene, you're going to be providing us a summary before we go into our, um, our really working session. Um, 
one of the things that I would like to also bring to all of our attention is as we continue to think about the role of a, the possibility of remote learning school in Connecticut, uh, just to keep at the forefront some of the things that are happening across the ocean in Ukraine. When we begin to think about uh, the reality is the reality, we most likely are going to be, as we have done before in the state, received welcome some of these children and families into our state. Uh, there is over 3 million already they have left their country. So something to consider as we think about support for English learners, support social and emotional, all those things that we need to keep in mind. So I want to bring it into the space uh, as part of our discourse because it also focus on everything that we have been focusing about the needs of our students. So something for us to keep in mind. So uh, with that, uh, Irene, if you don't mind providing us with the summary of some of the research that has already uh, been on the way. Absolutely. Thank you, Ingrid. So what we have planned for you today, because we are in a virtual space and we're trying to find the best way to collect your input for each section of that outline, we will be utilizing the tool Menti again. And so I have QR codes, one for each section of the outline, and we'll take our time. That'll give you a chance to just process the, the section of the outline and then type in your um, considerations or your thoughts, recommendations for what needs to be included in that particular section, because we are co-writers of this report. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. And again, I have five slides set up. Each slide will have its own QR code. You can hold up your camera to it and access the Menti. And then I'll show the Menti so you can see the comments coming in. <clears throat> or you can actually just go to www.menti.com and then each section of the report has its own code. So I know there's a lot to process there, but we're going to take our time and we'll be patient and we'll continue to work through the chat as well. So, so let me uh, let me share my screen so you can see what that looks like. OK, so I will present. So this is the first section. So you can already hold up your camera and um, hold it up to the QR code and just hit that and it'll go to the Menti itself. Section one, though, um, calls for us to share what we've learned and analyzed on the impact of remote learning. What we wanted to share with you is that much of this information will be gleaned from the actual audit that is taking place and also outlined in the statute in section 389. What I do want to provide with you here right now, um, and Ajit Gopalakrishnan, our colleague, is um, working with the collaborative, the CCERC collaborative, to conduct this audit to share with us what is the impact on remote learning, on educational attainment, physical and emotional development, as well as the quality of instructional delivery. Just so that you know, a research team has been assembled with a, um, an investigator, the, the, the personal investigator um, from Yale, and then there's co-investigators from UConn and others from Yale doing that initial uh, work. Ajit wanted me to make sure that you, we all understood that there's years of quantitative data that's been provided from the CSDE to these researchers to begin their preliminary quantitative findings, which is expected in April. The researchers will be prepared to share this information to you, the commission members, uh, at our April meeting. So that um, is some good news and helps us with this report. A lot of aspects of the audit will also require qualitative data. So there's going to be a collection or a survey in some form that will begin next month that will go out to districts and teachers and other folks in that area to give us that qualitative information. And then there is a full report that is due per the statute by January of 2025 but uh, Ajit and the team and the CCERC are hoping to have that much earlier in this calendar year. So though we want to ask you now what should be considered in section one, we thought it was important that you do realize that we will be getting a lot of information from this collaborative and this, this research audit. 
So Ingrid, if you are all set, we can start with doing the Menti and I'm going to be switching screens. So hopefully no one gets a little seasick as I go back and forth between the screens. Thank you, Irene. So for the purpose of the process that we are going to be um, doing together right now is for each one of the sections, we're going to give you five minutes for you to brainstorm from your perspective those items that you feel that the section should have. Feel free to turn your uh, your um, camera soft so that you have the opportunity to really process this on your own. Just make sure that you enter it into the mentee. We will call you back. You will hear my voice of five minutes and that will be an indication that we're coming back so that you can begin to see what your colleagues have added as aspects of the report and then we can engage in a conversation regarding uh, key pieces that you see definitely have to be part of this report and then we will continue the process with every single section of the report. So with that said, I hope that everybody have had access to the code. Um, I will ask also if we could put the website, um, Irene, on the chat in case that somebody wants to access it through their computer so that they are able to access it, please. And someone's asking to repost the QR code. Sure, I'll do that now. Yeah. And this is, I should add, this is brainstorming uh, in the exactly. virtual space, so it really is just uh, every idea, every thought that you have, and as you know how we've worked here, we'll come back, we'll share it with you. You'll have reflection time as we go forward, even after today's meeting, but this gets us started in terms, at, at least from the department, in terms of what is this report uh, that the commission will be working on that, that is very helpful to us. Thank you. So the um, website is posted in the chat for you, and here is the code. So. So I can see uh, information is coming in, so it's working. That's correct. perfect. Thank <laughs> you. So we will go ahead and start the five minutes now. Ingrid, do you have a time check? Yes, I do. We have two more minutes. And just so that everyone knows, we will, we will be able to pull the report from the mentee 
so that w things aren't lost or just held in these small boxes. We'll be able to pull that information and pull it into the outline, and that can be shared at our next meeting. Forty five seconds. That's our timer. So if we can have you um, come back and just uh, we are going to be looking at your perspective of what you have added as part of these. The first section of the of the report uh, for those of you that would like to expand on what you have put forward for those of you who want to inquire about some of the questions. Um, so also if you do were not able to add it to this feel free to put in the chat anyway we will collect your perspective either way so make sure you can enter it into the chat as well so um let's open the 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 virtual space for um, a dialogue for a discussion regarding what you have before you feel free to raise your hand and bring your perspective into the space I do want to recognize. I'm sorry, Ingrid. I just I do want to recognize Michelle's uh, comment in the chat. Mm -hmm. I I didn't realize that you're limited to just one response, but I'm going to write that down, Michelle, so it's not lost. Um, the additional points related to equity and addressing the match between learner pedagogy and adult support at home. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for capturing that as well, uh, Irene. Kate. Oh, Kathy. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, we are not able to hear you. Can anyone hear Kathy or is it just me? I just want to okay, all right. I just want to make sure it's not my system. And it's not showing you as muted, so there may be something else going on there. Yeah, that's what I was noticing. OK, she'll she'll come back in. OK, thank you. Thank you. Others. So Irene, can you maybe quickly go through what's on there? Some of us are maybe um, a little challenged with the size of the, <laughs> the, the font. So maybe you can summarize. Sure, sure. Um, so to read some of the comments, is that your suggestion, Commissioner? Yeah. OK, yeah. sure. <laughs> So um, address the potential of remote learning when intentionally planned versus the remote learning that occurred in response to the pandemic. And I think we heard that in other or we can see that addressed in other comments that what was in 2021 is not an example of best practices, but what happens in an emergency response situation. Include data of, of diverse student particip participation and their impact. And I believe that is indeed a part of the audit. We have heard that students responded very differently in different districts and the resources and engagement matters. So support for students with disability needs to be equitable across all districts for this to be positive. Agreed, and I think your um, whoever added the comment about the evaluation of the quality and impact of teaching, learning and curricula and all things in this experience um, is important and will again also be a part of the audit. Analysis of the equity of access, resources and preparation. 
ensuring equal access to students regardless of their geographical location or ability to travel to a school or a building. So I'll pause there for a moment. I see that Kate has her hand up. And Kathy is also um, able to join us. So um, Kate, if you will go ahead and then Kathy, you will go next. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that one of the most important things is, is to reflect um, in the report that what we experienced is not what we are planning because <laughs> I think there there needs to be a strong delineation about impact of remote learning in a pandemic versus a planned structured and intentional product um, you know oftentimes the data from the pandemic is not really reflective of the potential of of um, remote uh, although I will say it gave us strong indicators of the boundaries, I think, of some of the remote instructional practices. So it's not that that pandemic learning wasn't valid. Uh, I just don't think it actually spoke to the potential as strongly as it spoke to the boundaries. Thank you so much for that comment, Kate. Kathy? I, I couldn't agree more with what Kate was just sharing about what we did in 2021 versus what we're planning through the implementation of, of these standards. Um, but I also want to add that I think that it really opens the door for districts, specifically for students with disabilities, when one district may be really struggling to find, say, a speech pathologist, but may have an, an arrangement with another district to provide those services remotely. I think that that's something that really needs to be highlighted in this report. Um, especially as we are facing a national shortage in finding certified personnel to service students with disabilities. Um, I think that we've got a huge opportunity in front of us that we really need to take advantage of with this. Thank you for that, Kathy. Great perspectives. Any other thoughts? Making sure that I don't see any other hands. Fran, <laughs> welcome. Oh, thank you. I apologize for being so late. I thought I was going to be called to speak, but they they were doing a lot of talking at that education committee. So I apologize, guys, but I'm here. Sorry. Not a problem. Glad you were able to join us. So not seeing any other uh, comments, questions perspectives. We're going to go ahead and move to the next section of the report, Irene, and it will be the same process. Correct. Mm -hmm. And just uh, just a reminder, I'm going to share my screen for the second QR code. We are this is the report to yes, certainly examine and analyze what was before, but this is the data that we do collect is going to help us inform and write the report on a statewide state run remote learning school for K-12. So just want to make sure we remind ourselves of that and the, the purpose of this. So let me share my screen. This is the second QR code. It's a different number related to this one. So if you're using, you, cannot, you, you can still use menti.com, but there's another set of digits here. So I'll give a moment if you want to open up your camera and take a picture. It should send you right to Menti and then I'll share. That one. And the question is at the top. What we're considering is the feasibility of creating statewide remote learning school. So as you consider the feasibility, this is where you begin to think about the perspectives that were presented by those um, national and local perspectives that we receive about some of the experiences, some of the aspects of what will look like for them. So begin to think about it that way. Is this feasible for Connecticut? Is this feasible for, for our state? I'll put a little bit more detail in. Oh, it may not have come through very well. I see it as purple. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, let me share this just so you can see. This is the outline. 
right here. These are the types of things we need to address. In section two. Could you make it a little bit larger? <laughs> sure. <laughs> How's that? Ah, oh, that's much better. So I'll be switching back and forth once more. Here is the QR code with the website. And then we can start to see how our answer is coming in. If any, and there we go. And the issuance of a diploma is within the statute. So that is addressed there. So Ingrid, I just want to make sure that you've set the timer so that we yep, have this all set. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Two more minutes. We have 30 seconds.
that's our time. So let's see. Uh, we want to bring perspectives into the space. Thank you, Irene. As we did before, Irene, would you mind uh, just bringing forward a couple of the statements that have been put? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, certainly, some there are some comments saying that it is feasible. However, there are things we need to consider, such as a centralized approach with um, to ensure equitable access. Um, and consistency. Include some of the key principles that we have been discussing all along that have informed the determination of feasibility. Some additional questions to make sure I, I think if I'm reading it correctly to consider in the report, who's the target audience of this statewide school? Who's responsible for the technology? What what is the cost to the state and district? Who will employ the teachers? How does that impact union status? Multiple times uh, a need to be centrally operated. Also looking at models that we already have um, as assets, such as our technical high school system. Certainly looking at exemplars. Um, and looking at, I think, our, our measures. What are our performance measures? How will we measure this? So I'll stop sharing so that we can open it up further, Ingrid, if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Comments regarding section two, feasibility of creating a statewide remote learning school. Perspectives and comments that you would like to add? Fran? I'm sorry, I'm driving, so I can't really take advantage of the um, of the voting and the comments, but mm -hmm. I agree with the comments that have been said. I think it is feasible, but I worry about the financial um, um, cost, and I, I worry about many of the things that have um, have already been said, and I want to be very, very clear that what is that enrollment going to look like? Um, and that it also concerns me um, in what we have heard from other states. So just want to just want to add that to it. Um, and um, I, I guess I also want to know. I, I'm wondering if we can somehow find out the need um, before we start designing this whole thing. Um, is there any way to determine how many people actually want this? Thank you. Uh, great question, uh, Fran. Let me, uh, if I can just go a little, ask you a follow up question regarding you enrollment when you said who, uh, who will be enrolled what are your level of concerns there what are you thinking as it relates to enrollment and then Kate, you can go next thank you listen i think i think our school districts do the very best they can but i worry sometimes that if a child is somewhat unmanageable um would this be something that they would um, suggest for that child? I also have heard parents um, and families talking about, and I'm not sure of myself here, but I've heard families talking about, um, you know, children with special needs and how they were better served um, in remote learning. And I'd want to know more about that because I want to know are we really preparing that child for the future and for the, the global workplace? Um, and, you know, but I, I'm unsure of myself. Maybe we are. And the other piece that really did bother me was some, I, I also heard families saying, well, my child was bullied and during remote learning, my child was not bullied. And I just think that's something we have to deal with. Um, I would be really dismayed if families chose remote learning to escape in-person bullying. 
then, you know, we're not doing something right. And so those are the kinds of things that I, I have a concern about. Thank you so much for that follow up, um, Fran. Thank you, Kate and then Kathy. Um, I, I would like to kind of take a little bit of jump off of what Fran said. And uh, one of my big fears about remote instruction is that it becomes some sort of escape hatch um, as opposed to a productive measure of education. So when we talk about feasibility, I think intention is incredibly important to have it as a centerpiece of the ideology of its of its advent. And we have the ability to control that right now. Um, you know, once things, I think one of the things that I take away from the organizations that we listen to is in many cases, those kind of just happened as a result of, we have to do something. We need to understand what our, our goal, our end game is here. So I do think understanding the desire, the, the where are we really charging this bus towards? What need are we trying to meet? Is a core prin principle of, of the establishment of the end product. Um, if we are attempting to address the needs of, of kids who struggle in person, who are difficult learners, who need an alternative program, that's one thing. But I hear a lot often as the community dialogue around this question around medically fragile children and this perception of this intense need around medically fragile children. Um, and to Fran's point, is that perception or reality? Mm -hmm. So I think at, at some point we need to close the gap between what we perceive to be true and what is actually true about the need we're trying to meet with a remote instruction program, uh, which is a big ask. But I do think it's a real ask that if we're going to talk about going down a multi-million dollar road, um, even if probably in the we talk about establishing like a magnet program that's remote, um, this is a multi-million dollar commitment. I think we should know whether the need is real or perceived. Is it reactionary to a pandemic or longstanding for a planning practice? So feasibility should really hinge on those kinds of questions being answered, um, which is why intention to me is so critical and understanding why we're doing this is so critical. Um, it's one thing to reflect and react to a pandemic. It's another thing to make a multi-million dollar, multi-year investment in a pro program based on what we perceive to be a need. So uh, to me, we have to close that gap in really answering the feasibility question with any sort of significant authority. Um, so, uh, you know, I, that speaks to me. Um, and, you know, I, as has been the case throughout this, uh, I do not want to provide a program that becomes a dumping ground. And we did hear that very clearly articulated in all the programs that we um, we met with is that we were taking kids and moving them into this classification because things were hard. Um, and maybe that's appropriate at times. I don't want to dismiss that there is a there is maybe a space where a remote option has value in that environment, but I don't want it to become the easy out. I think that there's other questions we should be asking ourselves um, about those things. So, I think that perception and reality need to become aligned. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, you, uh, your colleagues are definitely in agreement with you, as you can see the comments on the chat regarding how do we ensure that we are looking at the perception and the reality. So thank you for that perspective. Kathy? Kate, I couldn't agree more with you, and I'm actually going to use springboard off of your response and say that one of the biggest concerns that I have with a remote school is those students who are dealing with school phobia and school avoidance and not wanting to come and or agoraphobia and not wanting to leave their home and just providing another venue for allowing that to metastasize and grow so that they become shut in and really long term shut ins. Um, I, I'm concerned because the world doesn't exist as much as we'd like to think it does, it does not exist solely on a flat screen. It's a three-dimensional world. And part of what we're supposed to be teaching children, 
of all walks of life, not just students with disabilities, um, is, is how to be a part of how to be a productive part of that three dimensional world. And if we never leave our home, if we never leave the screen, how are we effectively pre you know, preparing that young person, whatever age they are, for interacting in a larger environment? and problem solving in a larger environment. The answer can't always be, I'm just going to stay at home and do it this way. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there's any other thoughts before we move on. Um, one of the things that I want to remind, oh, go ahead, Doug. Mm -hmm. Oh, just, I mean, perhaps one of the things we include in the feasibility is, um, uh, I mean, it, this echoes what Kate and Fran suggested it is what is, what's the demand side of it, um, but, but also um, sort of just, just to, just to clarify that um, providing adequate surrounds for parents to make really informed decisions as to what they're getting into, what they what they desire, et cetera. Um, the supports that are available through schools already, I think is really important. Um, one theme that we keep talking about here is informed decision making on behalf of parents and, and what this really means as opposed to I've got a challenge with my, you know, with with our, our learner and this looks like, you know, the, the easy out or something like that. Um, it's not to minimize parent decision making, but they're under a tremendous amount of stress and sometimes this can look like uh, an easier solution than other taking other paths that school districts may be equipped to come alongside them with. Thank you for that, Doug. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to bring into the space and remind us as we continue to move this forward is the the um, opportunity and the power that you hold as members of the commission to put those recommendations forward. The, the task is to look at it and say, is this feasible? So the opportunity to actually within that report indicate some of the things that <laughs> we want to ensure that are looked at before a final decision is made. And I think that I want to make sure that we harness the, the opportunity and power that is being held by the commission to be able to put that forward based on our conversation. So that's why we want to take it a step by step as it relates what are what it is that we've been asked to do and what it is the opportunity to we have to really present the viewpoints and those ones, especially those ones who we represent for our families and our communities at this point. So Doug, do you have another comment? I am lowering my virtual hand. Oh, Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm trying to keep, you know, being very aware of your perspectives in the space. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so now let's go to the next uh, section of the report, which is section three, and it's specifically and very aligned to some of the comments that you already put forward. So um, it is about the costs. Thank you, Irene. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is specific to what it would cost essentially the state to stand up a statewide K-12 remote learning school. We'll be asking you in the, the next one about the fiscal impact, what we know of what it costs districts. Mm -hmm. So again, part of that landscape analysis. But right now we're wondering what are the costs associating associated to with establishing a statewide remote school? So I'm going to go to the QR code in the slide. Hopefully that's big enough. So again, you can open up your camera and scan this. This will take you to the next one, the third one. And again, the, the URL has changed because the numbers have changed for this particular question. So I'll leave it here for a moment and then we'll go to the mentee to see the comments come in. And then Ingrid, you can start your timer. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All set.
We have a minute and 30 seconds left. Thirty more seconds. Thank you. So let's follow the process that we had had in place already. Irene, would you mind selecting, summarizing some of the statements? Not at all, thank you. So I'm going to start at the top. Um, certainly all costs related to setting up and operating the statewide remote learning opportunity. Um, and it should be so much on the state so that no district or student is denied access. Costs should be fully supported by the CSDE and the General Assembly will need to build that into their annual budget. More granular um, staff administration, the technology, the curriculum required, all costs that um, would need to be incurred for families, technology, access to technology, training. Um, costs related to special education and including special subjects, so such as electives like world language. The cost of devices that might be provided to students. And other support staff required to operate or run this statewide school. I'm just looking through. And if a city town who cannot afford Will not. OK, so there's a concern here that if a town or city cannot afford to participate, if there's a cost coming from the district, if I'm understanding it correctly, then we further widen the learning gap and create additional inequities. So again, another consideration in the cost. So um, Ingrid, I'll turn it back to you to open it up. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, let's um, let's listen to your perspectives. <clears throat> Uh, Doug? Uh, my comment is just that I think there are generally going to be two. If we're looking at the platform and instruction provided, two different flavors, if you will. One is sort of build your own in you know the Connecticut version of this, and then another one might be to partner with an existing program. Um, not to bias the outcome, but my leaning would be much more in partnering with an existing program um, because of some of the points we've made earlier, because we don't know what the demand is going to be uh, to build something and put a tremendous amount of potentially sunk costs into a platform and a, um, you know, the training, et cetera, without knowing how sustainable or, or um, required and demanded it is, uh, it doesn't make sense. It seems to, it seems that we should sort of go in, uh, wade into the water, if you will, and see what that real demand would be um, so that we're minimizing some of those sunk costs, some of those one-time costs. Thank you, Doug. Others? Chip? No? Okay. <laughs> 
I'm reacting to every single movement I see on the on the, the screen, so <laughs> I just want to make sure. Michelle? Um, I just wonder if there's room to, in keeping with what Doug was saying about buying into a model that already exists and hearing many of the committee's concerns about equity and access, to think about how we might supplement their models to provide the technology or additional supports that ensures more equitable access to those models. So just something to think about and in, in how they've implemented those models and how we might modify that implementation in some way or enhance it. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Kate? Um, my only caution in some of the, like, buying the, the canned programs, if you will, um, is I still worry, particularly at the high school level, with accreditation requirements and whether or not we would be creating a false equivalency. So when we when we purchase a, a program from somebody else, we, we genuinely lose control over the construct of the education. Um, and so I think if our objective is to consistently uh, produce an education across all platforms that's consistent. I worry that handing over control is an ease factor in curricular decision making, but also weakens um, sort of the standpoint of, you know, I bought this sort of generic curriculum that works across the states in the country, but may not meet our expectations here in Connecticut. Um, so to that end, I think if we were to deploy a canned program, which I do not love at all, because I think you get what you pay for um, <laughs> in those guidelines. Uh, I also think it's hard for teachers to own. I don't love canned programs when we buy them and deploy them in-person instruction. Um, and I'm not an advocate of those either. Um, but I think particularly in this landscape, uh, it might be more work but we might end up with a higher quality product if we invest in our, our own strategic curricular design. Um, I, I think we, you know, with having taught remotely, sometimes we overcomplicate, um, you know, overcomplicate this question. Uh, teachers, and, and I think somebody, I don't even saw it, but teachers need the flexibility um, to make sure that what needs to happen happens. And so whatever curriculum we adopt or, or we pursue, we just have to be super cautious. Um, and I also worry that when, if we like sign up with a program, you're gonna have teachers from all over the country potentially with all sorts of different certification expectations potentially. Um, and I think, you know, we've set a pretty high bar in Connecticut for what we expect out of schools, I would hate to see us not uphold that same set of expectations in the remote world. Um, Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Ingrid, if I may, um, just the good, I think what I wanted to share is that we have the standards for remote learning, which you engaged in, and that set a very high bar. And I'm hearing the feedback from districts as I talk with different superintendent groups. And embedded in there is the analysis of the programs that they would choose to select, right? So I think those standards will come forward as you know as we go forward with this, and they will help guide the design of that. So I just wanted to remind ourselves that, however it turns out, those standards for remote learning, which is an evolving process as well, will help guide the decision making, the conversation, and that that standard, that level of standard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irene, for that uh, reminder. So being conscious of the time, I'm going to go ahead and move us forward. I'm just going to double check. Michelle, if that is another perspective, it was from the previous. Thank you. And Fran, just to make sure that um, you still with us and that you did not have another comment. So I just want to make sure. I'm still there. I'm um, just not in a place where I can do a lot of <laughs> commenting, but I'm listening intently. OK, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move to the next one, which was, would be section four. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. 
So section four is um, another, again, the analysis of what was the fiscal impact that various remote learning models had on districts. So really here, maybe this is a chance for you to provide us with some of those questions or ideas on how to understand what the fiscal impact was on districts. Uh, so that's how I have interpreted this, but Ingrid, you can, you're very good at interpreting those. <laughs> so uh, yes, at this point is, from your perspective, what could be some of those fiscal impacts, especially based on the conversations that we're having today and the experiences that you have with the communities and the, the groups that you support? So what could be some of the things that we need to keep in mind regarding the fiscal impact? Think broadly. You know, I know you already began to put some of those perspectives in the space, technology, but think broadly. What are some include the community uh, as you begin to brainstorm this particular section? And, and I a, think the question there is on districts, right? Yes. And so bring it, lifting up that those mm -hmm. concerns. Thank you. Now we'll start our time now. One more minute.
that's our time. Thank you, Aileen. Yeah. So some good, um, good thinking here. Um, questions and concerns or things to consider of the funding for district and if there was a shift if students that enrolled in the remote, the statewide remote learning school, what does that mean for funding at the district or local level? Um, certainly uh, funding related to students with disabilities and the, I, the process of billing back to districts. How would IDEA work um, for funding with students enrolled in this school? The technology, certainly hardware and software and maintenance and support staff. We know that that um, increased a lot during uh, the pandemic for districts. There's something else to learn. Connectivity. The increase in tools that were supporting multilingual learners. Just scrolling through and a lot of the, the PD, the professional learning, professional development training in using the technology that was um, certainly ramped up during this time and that was a considerable impact on districts. So I'll pause there, Ingrid. Thank you, Irene. Any perspectives from the particular perspectives from the group? Additions to the comments presented. Kathy? I just want to speak on behalf of all of my colleagues in pupil services and special education. We cannot afford to lose one penny um, of what we are already receiving because we are already receiving not enough money on a rate. And I'm not talking about the stimulus funds that were sent to us because those are for very prescribed purposes. But in the every year function of education, we're not getting what we need from the federal government and towns are strapped to continue to be able to meet, you know, maintenance of effort in educating students where we have a rising cost. So if, if districts are going to be built in any way, shape or form for this, I think you're going to see tremendous resistance. Um, we just can't afford to lose a penny. Thank you for that, uh, Kathy, clear message. Thank you, thank you. Other thoughts? Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and move to the last section. We're making it through the last section. Listen, we are we are doing this outline virtually. This is something I'm telling you. <laughs> Talking about technology in virtual learning, <laughs> in virtual work. Here we are. So the last section, Irene, if you don't mind, is specifically about adequate supports. I know you have plenty to say about this one, so let's let's take a look at what this section is about. Okay. So before I share the QR code, I just wanted to make sure we understood what this is asking. So it's right here. Let me move a few things here. Mm -hmm. So what are the support services, the roles of each in in these, this was from the statute and what we should not fail to consider. So there, there could be more that we add to this. So I just wanted to make sure we understood that. And here is the QR code. So again, open your camera. It'll take you to the last one for adequate support services. I'm starting our time now.
One more minute. That's our time. Thank you. Irene. Absolutely. So some really great uh, thoughts and ideas and things that we should not fail to consider. Certainly connections. Um, how will the learners remain connected to the district? Um, that personal connection, the varied adults that um, that we provide in district, how will they remain connected to them? ensuring all multilingual learners have the support that's needed, including native language instruction, mental health services, school counseling services, um, certainly supervision, who will be su supervising the students um, as this takes place because parents need to work. Engagement and participation, so we want to be sure be assured that the students do engage and participate in this, but um, carefully considering attendance. Question about um, the tech support. Is this a collaborative, I think, between the state and the, the school where the students are coming from, or will the state run school also provide state run provided tech support services? And I like this one that if the standards define the outputs, then the supports define, define the input. So mapping the standards in another way, um, ensuring that we're addressing the needs of students, educators, parents, and leaders. So I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Irene. So comments regarding this is specifically about the adequate supports for our students and their families. You know, I'm an educator by nature. 30 seconds before we move on. <laughs> okay. okay, seeing none, uh, we have accomplished our task for the meeting. We have gone through every single one of the five components of the report. You have provided your perspective through the brainstorming activities. So um, I know that uh, there's a 
intentionality behind this process in order to begin to gather your feedback, your thoughts, so that the construction of the uh, report began to take shape. We will be compiling all this information together and we will be um, providing you that information for your feedback again as we begin to build this uh, report together. So um, with that said, I know that we have a couple of uh, next steps and then we will bring the commissioner in to uh, bring us to a closure. So um, Irene, would you mind putting the next step uh, for us? Uh, please, thank you. So I know we are all familiar with the elevator speech. So this is going to be a little bit of a homework for all of you. So this, what we would like you to do next before our next meeting will be for you to write a paragraph. Your elevator speech, think about it this way. You're in the supermarket and somebody says, oh, I watched a video about the Remote Learning Commission. You're part of it. Can you tell me what that is all about? And what benefits do that exist for me? You have two minutes to explain it. But we're just asking for a paragraph here. And it's interesting enough that I'm sharing this experience with you because that just happened to me the other day. <laughs> Somebody said, I watched that you, your name and I saw that you're facilitating. So we want to make sure that you bring that perspective into the space. How would you share with anyone? It could be the supermarket, a colleague in the elevator that is asking you this question. What is the purpose? What is the role? So if you don't mind, Think about it from your perspective. You were assigned, actually identified to this commission because of who you are, the organization to represent, and the advocacy that you provide. Use your energy and your passion in explaining the commission, and don't 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 be don't don't, don't pull back regarding the concerns. Don't pull back regarding the concerns. We're asking for a paragraph. I know uh, you're probably ready to buy to write a dissertation, but you only have a minute. I, I you see, I reduced it from two to one because I know it's different as you write it when you speak it. So you have a minute to say um, to to provide this information. There is intentionality behind this exercise. In addition to that, we are going to be giving you the link so that you can begin to enter that information in the link. It's a Google document that we all going to have access to. Only us will have access to. So feel free and that will be uh, your the request before our next meeting that we will start from that point. So, so Ingrid, I, mm -hmm. I, I did put the link in the chat, but we'll also follow up in an email um, with the link as well. Thank you so much, Irene. So let me see what questions you might have regarding your assignment before our next time. Seeing none. 224. Commissioner, I give the meeting to you so that you can bring up. Talk about the next steps, the next meeting and then bring the meeting to a closure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ingrid, and to the Commission members. And I've been in listening mode because, wow, uh, really great, thoughtful information. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have you as a Commission to help guide uh, the work that we're doing. And I hope as folks watch these, they recognize the thoughtfulness uh, and really the perspectives that's brought into this space. And just to remind you, so we have the, the Commission report, and then the Department is required to take I've been guided by the Commission report to use that to develop a plan for the creation and implementation of a statewide remote learning school. So that's kind of the next piece. And current uh, legislation is that the department submit that no later than July 1 um, of 2023 uh, for that particular plan uh, to be developed and placed there. You may have seen there's a legislative proposal moving that date closer, uh, moving it from uh, July to January instead. Uh, we're on record, of, um, so we can certainly sh share a report with you that we do need the time. I think it's important uh, along this whole intentional process that we're going through. Uh, and there's also a proposal for, you know, we have legis current legislation for the school year commencing July 1, 2022, 
uh, for local boards to opt to be able to authorize remote learning to uh, students in grades 9 through 12. That's what the standards were based on. There's a proposal to change that time, that grade band from uh, to kindergarten to grade 12, which we don't have standards uh, developed for that. As you know, we talked, we did develop standards for, for the high school. So anyway, we're on, we're on record of that as well, but I just really wanted to, to share that with you. Just know that we are not disbanding our remote learning commission. So although the department is charged with that plan, we're going to make sure you're in it with us as we develop that plan and for all the work that needs to be done. So I don't know if that's a threat or a promise, but you're in it with us for the long haul. And I mean that seriously because it is so important for all these perspectives and for everything that we're working on that we're doing this together. So I just really wanted to remind you of where we're where we're headed. So thank you very much for today and thank you for the team, um, Irene. Uh, Paul, you're here, Ingrid, for facilitating this. Not only, you know, that's why when I testify about when we get charged with task force or commission, we they spend a lot of time trying to make sure the time we we spend together uh, is thoughtful and is impactful. And so I just want to thank them for for all the work that they're doing to make sure when we get together that we have the outcomes that we're looking for. So thank you, team. Uh, our next meeting, I think, is already scheduled. I mean, what is the date? for our next meeting. It should already be on our calendars, right? Yes. So we're giving you two dates um, just so that we can plan uh, April 18th and May 16th from 1 to 2.30. Thank you. And so please get those on your calendars. As you know, in between, we'll be sending you information, sending you reminders, uh, uh, summarizing everything you did today in one spot. I know, I'm sure if you're like me, you want to see it all under the categories, right, Kate? So we'll make sure we get it out uh, to you. And please, uh, you know where to find us to continue to share your thoughts as we build this out. So thank you again. Uh, thank you very much for our time today. And we we'll look forward to our next meeting. Any final thoughts? Uh, your voice in the room just to wrap us up. What do you like? What do you, you know, where we're going? Any of those kinds of things are welcomed at this point. Anything we can be doing better as we go forward. I want to thank um, Charlene. I just want to really underscore uh, so often I have uh, meetings that stink um, and just suck time out of my life. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, some of you may feel the same way about other things you attend, um, but I truly do appreciate the thoughtfulness of trying to be productive during this time to move us towards our goal. Um, I am optimistic that because we are in being so intentional and inclusive that we will go to do something that is valuable. So I appreciate the energy that it is required to planning a good meeting. Um, I, I wrote down this new Mentimeter. I haven't used that before, but I like it. So I appreciate the um, exposure to something new as well. So uh, much appreciation. And I, I hope that the legislature, I too have um, repeatedly asked them, could they just let us do our job? Uh, so hopefully, fingers crossed, somebody's listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And it's, so this is a learning community as well. So the first time I saw the Mentimeter user, I was like, wow, that's really great. So uh, thank the folks here for bringing it in the space. So again, thank you all very much. Be safe, be well uh, until our next meeting.